Welcome to Horror Babble. We're currently preparing to release the very first collection of short stories penned by the one and only MD Vickers in both ebook and audiobook formats. Part of the process has been to re record a couple of older recordings, one of which we're presenting today a new take on The Wardrobe. The old recording was recorded prior to the creation of Horror Babble, and so we thought it was important to bring it up to speed. We'll share more on the upcoming Vickers collection in the near future. The image you're looking at was produced by the superbly talented Duncan K. See the video description below for links to Duncan's stuff. We hope you enjoy the new recording. The Wardrobe by M. D. Vickers The house belonging to my much-respected friend and colleague, Professor John David Strauber, was a massive, sprawling affair, surrounded by expansive lawns that were more akin to fields. It made me feel humble and inferior in the midst of such blatant wealth and grandeur. Yet the feeling was always easily quashed after the first awestruck thirty seconds or so. Another person might also have experienced a deep envy— but that emotion lay very dormant amongst the genetic entwinings of my nature. Stood behind, and slightly to the left of me, was another friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Jack Brownlow. He didn't possess a middle name. He was a tall man, six-two or three, with a bowler hat strategically placed on the top of his head, in an effort to cover up his gleaming pate. He was a smart dresser, always well-groomed, and had been born with a constantly worrying nature. The hair loss was a product of that flawed trait. Also, like Strauber, he had never married. I was used to a bit of a weight. The slave, disguised as a butler, Albert Straps, was a quick walker, but the journey was invariably a long one, traversing the myriad of rooms and corridors like a lone ant through a colony. "'Pull it again, Jim,' Jack Brownlow remarked hesitantly. Even though my back was to him, I could sense his damp palms ringing together in a characteristically anxious manner. I reached for it again, reasoning that I had good cause to, as a full minute had elapsed, when hurried footfalls suddenly sounded from behind the thick oak door. At last, I remarked, picking up my case that had been temporarily placed on the floor. The door began to open slowly, gradually picking up momentum. The haggard face of Albert Straps came into view. His expression very rarely changed, that of the middle-aged martyr. Good afternoon, Albert. This is my friend, Dr. Jack Brownlow. John is expecting us. We were ushered in by a slowly waved arm. A smell, reminiscent of childhood visits to museums, assailed my nostrils once more. Albert closed the heavy door behind us, and waited to receive our coats, hats, and the like. The vertically challenged butler almost disappeared from view, underneath the dutifully administered baggage. It appeared almost as if the garments and umbrellas were moving entirely of their own volition. Emerging from the cloakroom, Straps appeared, more agitated and miserable than before, if that was indeed possible. I almost brayed laughter out loud, upon observing a considerable bundle of silver hair that had slipped off his skull, and now hung down past his ear. The brill cream had betrayed him on this occasion. "'This way, gentlemen.' The comment was totally devoid of enthusiasm. I wondered, not for the first time, whether Albert Straps might enjoy life a bit more if he was dead— all three of us began to walk down the oak-panelled corridor, out of sync footsteps reverberating. Both Jack and I had to quicken up our usual pace, in order to keep up with the scuttling butler. After a journey of roughly half a mile, we turned right into a room that I immediately recognised as the library. Professor Strauber simultaneously raised himself from a chair and walked over, a cigar the width of a snooker cue butt in one hand, and a shorts glass in the other. The short would undoubtedly be Perno, with a drip or two of coke. "'James, wonderful to see you again.' I was grabbed and hugged. There was a brief crackle as the cigar poked into my hair. Perno slopped onto the floor behind me. I doubted very much that my trousers had escaped. "'This is Jack,' 
Jim mentioned your name on the phone. Jack Brownlow nodded and shook the proffered hand. Sit down, chaps. Sit right down. He waved an arm over the table and chairs. Albert, bring me three more of my cigars and the drinks trolley. And for Christ's sake, smile, you dreary old bugger. I was half expecting the professor to act out the butler's surname and begin lashing the back of his thin neck. Before he could, Albert's straps turned and left in an instant. The right-hand library door banged to in its frame. I really must get him to a psychiatrist, you know. The man's a walking doom merchant. All three of us nestled ourselves down into the comfortable chairs that formed a perimeter around the huge table. Strawber drew on his cigar and exhaled. I temporarily lost sight of him. Good journey, men? Train, was it? I nodded, glancing round the vast library. My roving line of vision settled on what looked like a wardrobe of some description, against the eastern wall. I couldn't remember observing it on previous visits. The right-hand door reopened. A trolley supporting a plethora of liquors trundled in, with Albert trailing. Also on the trolley were the three cigars. Thank you, Albert. Now give us a grin. There was a vague twitch of the butler's lips, and that was all. It'll do, I suppose. Now scram, you depressing mortal, and go and prepare dinner. Could I have this coming Monday off, sir? It's my uncle's funeral. I'd like to be there, pay my respects, as it were. Of course, Albert, not a problem. Strawber had gone crimson in the face, no doubt feeling acute embarrassment over his comments regarding his butler's sombre demeanour earlier. Straps nodded his head in a display of acknowledged gratitude, then left. Jack and I were handed a cigar each. Jack politely refused his, by way of a muted, I'm all right, thanks, John, and a barely discernible shake of the head. I keenly received mine, and began to remove the wide cardboard band, depicting the make that circled the middle of it. I gave it a good twenty-second study before placing the correct end between my teeth. My professor friend's arm stretched over. A solid gold lighter encroached in his hand. A tongue of flame leapt up from it and began to lick at the cigar. Five or six sucks and puffs later, it was stoked. I leaned back in the chair, glancing once again at the recently acquired item of furniture over near the wall. I opened my mouth, after removing the cigar, to comment about it. John Strauber preceded me. "'What would you like to drink, gentlemen? Plenty here to cater for all manner of tastes.' My eyes scanned the length and breadth of the mobile liquor store. I decided on a double Bailey's with ice. Brownlow's preference was a Jack Daniels. The drinks poured. The professor also leaned back in his seat. The action was accompanied by the creak and groan of suffering timber. "'Now then, chaps, I suppose you're wondering why you're here.' A dense plume of smoke pursued the question. "'Your invitation was a trifle vague,' I commented. "'What was it?' "'James, I have something to show you. Come down if you can, and bring a friend if you wish.' Strawber emitted a raucous laugh. <laughs> "'Yes, that was it. I like the air of mystery type of approach. It tends to make people more enthusiastic.' Jack Brownlow registered his appreciation of the comment with a brief blast of air down his nose. This rather unorthodox action was immediately followed by an upending of his whiskey glass. "'You are here to experience something that is both macabre and disturbing. I have never seen anything as menacingly bizarre as what I am about to show you. Follow me, if you will, and bring your drinks. You'll need them.' He led us over to the area manifested by the wardrobe-type thing that I had noted earlier. We stopped about six feet away from it. This is it. The wardrobe. The professor had turned pale, and his hand visibly shook as he applied Perno to his mouth. I looked at Jack. He returned my gaze. I averted my eyes to the piece of furniture before us. It was roughly ten foot tall and eight foot wide. It looked old. I was about to remark that it looked just like an ordinary antique wardrobe, when my line of vision, having traversed it downwards from the top, happened upon the legs. Something shifted in my mind, similar to a feeling of déjà vu, possibly a recollection of a terrible nightmare that had been mentally buried for years. Then it was gone, leaving me cold and trembling in its wake. The wooden legs were about eight to ten inches in height. At the bottom of each— was a wood-carving of a bare human foot. 
The overall effect was indeed very disturbing. My professor friend looked at each of us in turn, waiting for one of us to speak. It was Jack Brownlow who broke the silence. Those feet! Why? He turned to Straub. I did likewise. The professor took a deep, shaky breath before expounding. I'm going to tell you of a strange incident that happened two weeks ago, a couple of days after I purchased the wardrobe. Every word of it is the truth. Albert will indeed verify the account, if you're in any doubt. We both stared at his bloodless face above his beard. I doubted very much that verification would be required. I invited several friends round for an informal seminar. Nothing serious. It just entailed a few drinks and cigars, and a general chat about the universe. After about an hour or so, we were sat in my drawing-room at the time. A fellow named William Newport excused himself and asked me for directions to the bathroom. I told him, and he promptly left. Possibly three-quarters of an hour had elapsed before we realised he hadn't returned. A few drinks had been consumed by this time, and, as you will know, the concept of time alters drastically in accordance. Anyway, I tracked Albert down and asked him had he seen him. The response was no, so we set about searching. As we were walking past the library, uh, I noticed something shining in the dimness, something that wouldn't normally be there. Upon opening the library doors— I realised what it was after about two or three seconds. Standing before us, no more than four feet away, was the wardrobe. The shining had been the handles reflecting the lamps in the hallway. To put it simply, the wardrobe had moved. I stared once again at those hideous wooden feet, then back to Strauber. The wardrobe moved on its own, you mean? I asked incredulously. No other explanation. It was delivered by a team of four men and placed against the wall. It's incredibly heavy. What other explanation can there be? What about this Newport fellow? Brownlow asked. His glass had been entirely drained. This is what I think happened. The wardrobe placed itself deliberately in front of the library doors, with both its doors wide open. Obviously it left enough room for the library door to swing inwards. The unfortunate Bill Newport enters the library for whatever reason, and the wardrobe, in effect, eats him. With all due respect, John, that's absolutely absurd. I was shaking my head quickly, fear beginning to gnaw at the edges of my brain. Aside from the ridiculous notion that it even moved, the wardrobe's nearly a foot off the floor. How could he just walk into it? Two possibilities. One is that he simply stumbled inside. Another is that the legs retracted down to the feet, thus leaving a gap of only two inches or so. He paused and reinserted his cigar, and immediately withdrew it. Another thing you should know. The wardrobe was making strange sounds, almost as if it was digesting him. Albert and I tried to open the doors, but we couldn't. They wouldn't budge. The cigar was administered once more. This time it stayed there. But he could have just gone home or something. Jack Brownlow rationalised. He sounded as if he was pleading for Strauber to agree. We found conclusive evidence that Newport met his fate with the wardrobe. One of his slip-on shoes was discovered within the vicinity. It must have fallen off in the struggle. I drained the rest of my baileys quickly, suddenly becoming aware of how damp my armpits were. This whole scenario was making me ill, both physically and mentally. I felt a brief flash of irritation towards the professor, for inviting us down and getting us involved with such an unsettling occurrence as this. So what happened after that? I told Albert to mention nothing to the guests unless they asked. If they had inquired as to his whereabouts, we would just have said that he'd gone home, as he was feeling a little unwell. We were both very shocked and disturbed at the time. <laughs> we still are. Brownlow proceeded to dab at his pate with an immaculately clean handkerchief, in order to soak up the minute beads of sweat glistening there. So what happened with the wardrobe? he asked replacing the neatly folded piece of square linen in his shirt pocket. The guests left around midnight. We had made the discovery four hours earlier than that. Uh, I summoned Albert once more, and we went back to the library. My heart was beating hard at this stage. He ceased speaking fleetingly to survey a cigar, which had taken the liberty of extinguishing itself. Igniting the tobacco baton once more, he resumed— the wardrobe was back against the wall, though not in the exact same position. 
It was a foot or two out. The grotesque growling sounds could still be heard, but to a lesser degree, as if the assimilation was in the latter stages. There were four indentations in the carpeting that corroborated with the area it had been standing in near the doors. The shoe was found several inches in front. Then, he added, as an afterthought, the opening of the library door probably pushed it nearer. Christ, I muttered, consciously stepping back a pace or two. Brownlow did likewise. Strauber, however, remained stationary. Don't worry, chaps. It shouldn't be hungry for a bit longer yet. Bill was a big fellow, carried a fair bit of pork, as it were. I stared at the professor, shocked. You're going to get rid of it, John, surely. Chop it up, or burn it? John Strauber looked directly at me, colour reappearing in his cheeks. Probably when the novelty is worn off, yes. But for the moment it's doing no harm. Not now you know about it. If it bothers you that much, just keep out of the library. It can't get out of here. I stared at the wardrobe once again, the hairs on the nape of my neck prickling in response. My blood temperature simultaneously lowered. Where the hell did you get it from? Let's get a refill, then I'll tell you. I think we could all do with one. We voyaged back to the table immediately. Glasses nicely topped up, we slumped down in the chairs. I was very relieved indeed to be away from that carnivorous item of furniture. I bought it from an antique shop in Devon, about two or three miles from here. The proprietor knew little about it, only that it was mid-seventeenth century. It was surprisingly cheap. I paid half the amount there and then. The rest was settled upon delivery. He took a mammoth gulp of perno, and smacked his lips appreciatively, before continuing. The proprietor took on a young assistant a week previously. Andrew, I think he said his name was. It was a Saturday when I visited the establishment. The proprietor went on to tell me that he hadn't seen the boy since a little after three on Wednesday afternoon. Apparently, he told him to go and give the stock a bit of a polish, while he tended to the books upstairs. I didn't think much of it until after Bill Newport's disappearance. I lifted my glass up to my mouth, before realising it had already been drained. After dinner, Albert showed us to our rooms. Mine was the same one I'd had on previous visits. Jack's was the adjoining one. We spent the remainder of the evening in the drawing-room. I was very drunk by this stage, as were my two colleagues. The conversation involved many topics, with the wardrobe being brought in every now and again. A dense mist of smoke enveloped us as we spoke, Jack not seeming the slightest bit concerned by his passive inhalation of the potentially lethal vapour at all. Albert bobbed in every now and again, waving a hand distastefully in front of his face to keep up with our requirements. The dinner that had been prepared for us could have been more aptly described as a banquet. My alimentary canal would be very busy indeed over the next few days or so. Glancing down at my Rolex watch revealed nothing but a blurred disk. The image clarified after two or three seconds. The hands conformed to a configuration of six minutes to twelve. Looking across at Jack Brownlow, I discovered that his head was angled right back over the edge of the luxurious settee, and was proceeding to slide slowly to the left. John Strauber appeared to be fixing me with a rather unnerving, drunken stare. His eyes were red and round, the hair above them unkempt. He ran a hand through his beard, with a lit cigar still in it. Realising this, his arm swung back round and rested on the arm of the chair once more. A belch erupted from his mouth. He substituted the loss of air with a long swallow of perno. Jack, his head and body having slid to the left at least twelve inches, snapped himself awake, and hoisted himself to the edge of his seat. He mumbled something that failed to make any sense, and stood up. I deciphered the word, bed, then watched his lurching progress out of the drawing-room. Turning back to the professor, I found that he had sunk into a barely conscious, alcoholic stupor, still clutching his cigar. Feeling a somewhat dulled sense of alarm, I weaved across to him and withdrew it from between his thick first and second fingers. Before eradicating the offending article, I lifted it to my lips, missing the first time, and took a deep puff. There was a slimy taste of aniseed coating the end of it. My face contorting into a distasteful grimace, I stabbed it out in the ashtray, and threw myself back into the chair. When I looked at my watch again, it was a little after seven, 
and the relentless drone of a vacuum cleaner was infiltrating my throbbing skull. Just to give you a brief introduction, as I believe I have yet to indulge in one, my name is Jim Bates, and I'm a general practitioner at a surgery in Bolton, Lancashire. I am married to Jean, with two teenage daughters, Joanne and Rebecca. As for my age, I generally refrain from disclosing it. Let's just say I remember watching the moon landing on TV, and let it go at that. That Saturday morning, all three of us suffered abysmal hangovers. Jack had been discovered by Albert in the early hours of dawn, slumped on a set of stairs. At exactly ten-thirty, the doorbell sounded. It seemed to reverberate through every room and passage in the house. There was no escape from its merciless, head-splitting chime. Straps went to deal with the perpetrator, employing his familiar, stiff-legged gait. I followed him, simply for something to do. The professor emerged from the library as we passed it, and joined us in our trek to the front door. He seemed deep in thought, regarding me with just a quick nod of the head. Strawber was certainly a man of many moods. The result of the call was a large, wooden crate. Albert signed a slip of paper, uttered a weary, "'Thank you,' and closed the door with a laboured grunt. "'Ah, my medical books! At last!' Strawber rubbed his hands together in a gesture of extreme glee, and proceeded to bark orders at his butler, who was failing to share his merriment. "'Wheel it into the library, Albert, then I can take a good look at them. I've waited ages for these.' Casters had been affixed to the underside of the crate for manoeuvrability. This wasn't exactly an alleviation for Straps, though, judging by his darkening face and rasping respiration. Feeling a twinge of guilt, I assisted him in pushing it, staring at the professor's broad back with something like escalating annoyance. Jack Brownlow emerged from a room I was unfamiliar with on our return journey. His face was pale and somehow gaunt, I know it's an horrendous cliché, but never again. He followed us to the library, drawing to an immediate halt outside the doors. I'll not go in, if you don't mind. Safer out here. I also felt a compelling reluctance to enter the library again. This feeling, though, was balanced against an unsurmountable sense of intrigue that I found myself choosing to assuage to. Come on, Jack. Like John says, it's only recently eaten— Besides, if we see it move, there'll be plenty of time to get out. The comment was designed to be humorous, but didn't come out that way. It made a shiver twist its snake-like path down my spinal cord. Jack eventually agreed to conform, and the crate was pushed through the doors. Albert, his task having been met, scurried off to do whatever was next on his mundane schedule. He'd only been gone four or five seconds, before Strauber charged out into the hallway, and bellowed for him to fetch the tire-lever out of one of the outbuildings. I presumed this would be to open the crate. Several minutes later, Albert returned with the requested item, and the crate lid was prized open. During the time that had elapsed, both Jack and I had been casting nervous glances in the direction of the wardrobe, which still loomed menacingly against the wall. It was an incredibly grotesque object to look at possibly the ugliest thing I had ever seen in my life. The best thing for it would be a litre or two of paraffin and a naked flame. I doubted Strauber would reciprocate the idea. Inside the crate were thirty hefty-looking volumes. Each book looked several inches thick. Strauber reached inside and took one out. The covers were leather-bound, as indicated by the powerful smell that began to sweetly fill my nose. Jack Brownlow seemed transfixed, as he peered inside. These are amazing. The medical knowledge contained must be immense. The professor nodded eagerly. Everything you ever wanted or need to know is within these very pages. There's over a grand's worth here, and <laughs> worth every pound. Jack reached inside the crate in a bit to pick up one of the books for a sample glance. I'd rather you didn't, just now. Strauber's voice was strangely hostile. Brownlow's arm whipped back, as if he just touched the glass front of an operational oven. Oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry. That was far too harsh. What I meant was, you can look at them, but later. My butler has an irksome tendency to borrow my new books and get them rather greasy. With this lot, I intend to put them on top of the wardrobe, temporarily, till I find somewhere better. 
There's a stool next to the wardrobe you can use if you wish to read one. You're both tall men, so reach won't be a problem. Albert, on the other hand, would have no chance. I frowned mentally. This sounded a bit strange, when you considered the rafts of space with untapped potential in his tall bookcases. Still, they were his books, and he was entitled to do what he liked with them. I certainly wouldn't be borrowing one, if it entailed being in close contact with the wardrobe. Not a chance. Look, you two leave me to it. I'll see to them. I recognized the tone in his voice at once. When he was in this sort of mood, it was very advisable to instantly oblige him. We both left, waiting till the doors were shut behind us before commencing muted conversation. I'll definitely give those books a miss, I remarked, expecting Jack to echo my sentiments. I know what you mean, but I'm tempted, I must admit. Enormous benefit could be gained from a read of those. He fell silent, and we began to walk down the hallway. I realized that I hadn't eaten any breakfast, and decided to amend the situation promptly. That afternoon, we retired to our rooms for a while. Jack had decided to do a bit of writing. I was doing nothing of any real significance. Feeling restless and agitated, I rose from the bed and left the room. My plan of action comprised an aimless wander about the house, while reflecting on Strauber and his nightmarish acquisition. Descending a flight of stairs, I could hear voices coming from a neighbouring room, seemingly without a closed door. I walked cautiously over, stopping short before the doorway. Out of the two on the left-hand side. But, sir, I can't do it. I won't do it. Oh, you will do it, Albert. Otherwise you know what will happen. Do it early tomorrow morning. Don't let me down. The voices were getting louder, so I scurried back up the stairs and returned to my quarters. What on earth was all that about? I asked the empty room. There was only an expected silence in response, and that was fine. I decided that I didn't want to know. The following day, Sunday, Strawber invited us into his billiard room for a snooker session. He had a full-size table house there, in pristine condition. The professor seemed in a somewhat furtive mood, not saying much and giving the distinct impression that his mind was somewhere else. This behavioural pattern wasn't entirely alien to him but I had to admit, certainly more extreme on this occasion. Drinks and cigars were there as refreshments, and I couldn't help observing the way Strauber was knocking back his perno. We concluded the session around mid-afternoon. As Jack and I were replacing our cues in the rack on the wall, the professor asked us, rather slurringly, if we had given any thought to reading his medical books, as we most definitely could if we wanted to. I told him that I probably wouldn't bother— while Jack replied with a, I'm not sure yet, I may do. We were then informed that the wardrobe was nothing to be feared, it was harmless, really. I nodded, dismissing this immediately as merely the drink talking. Strauber seemed about to say something else, shook his head, then removed his arms from our shoulders and zigzagged out of the room. What a quite bizarre chap, Brownlow remarked when he was out of earshot. He's like that sometimes, it's just his way. He's a very intelligent bloke, a genius, really. His moods tend to swing quite alarmingly. He suffers from manic depression, having had about six or seven nervous breakdowns. Lately, though, he's been all right. Seems to have extracted himself from the mental mire he fell into, as it were. Jack Brownlow raised his eyebrows, in the manner of one who doesn't know how else to react under such circumstances. We left the room and did our own thing— until the dinner gong summoned us at five o'clock. Albert Straps, the incessantly loyal butler, left to prepare for his uncle's funeral at seven o'clock. Jack and I thanked him for his kindness and efficiency before he went, as we wouldn't be seeing him upon his return. We were due to go back early Tuesday morning. Albert had till the afternoon off. That evening, John Strauber was very conspicuous by his absence. I strolled through the house calling his name, but there was no response. It was most probable that he had retired to his room, and was sleeping a dreamless slumber, while his body laboured intensely in an effort to detoxify itself. After the fruitless excursion, I joined Jack in the library, and partook in a cautious whisky and a cigar. Conversation focused on the wardrobe, 
still up against the wall and still looking positively vile. The medical books had been meticulously stacked in a row on top of it. Jack was still dithering about whether to read them or not. His hands would occasionally run up and down his creaseless trousers in a bid to dry them. I wouldn't honestly bother Jack. Why he's put them up there in the first place is beyond me. If, ridiculous as it seems, the wardrobe's done what he's purported it to have done, how does he expect us to consider going within inches of it just to borrow a book? Just leave it. Forget about them. He didn't seem convinced, however. When the time crept swiftly round to eleven-thirty, we decided to retire to our respective rooms. As we rose from the chairs, Jack glanced once more at the impressive line of volumes before exiting. The journey to our quarters was made in silence, both of us lost in our own thoughts. If I can't get to sleep, I might come down and just borrow one. I have to make sure my hands are clean, though. He laughed nervously, before bidding me good night and closing his door. I entered my own room and walked over to the window. After a couple of minutes surveying the stars, I changed and clambered into bed, suddenly realizing how much I missed Jean. Picking up the paperback novel on the bedside cabinet, I opened it, turned back the corner of the page, and began reading. Half an hour later, I heard a door open softly, then close again. A muffled padding of feet followed. So Jack had finally decided to brave the wardrobe. I thought about following him, then dismissed the idea. I felt incredibly tired all of a sudden, and my eyelids were beginning to droop. Jack could take care of himself. Turning the corner of the page I had read up to, I replaced the book on top of the cabinet, and settled down into the firm but soothingly comfortable mattress. My arms snaked out and clicked off the reading lamp next to the book. That night, I had a terrible dream about a wardrobe that ate me alive. My immediate thought, upon awakening, was of Jack Brownlow. The nightmare still held its vividness in my mind. My head felt numb and somehow spaced out. I dressed quickly, glancing at the bedside clock as I did so. The luminous green digits informed me it was sixteen minutes past six. My shoes were put on, and the laces hurriedly tied. I wrenched open the curtains, then opened the door and deftly closed it again. Two knocks were administered to the closed door of Jack's room. I listened intently for some sort of response. None came. Four more raps, slightly harder, were applied. Again, nothing. I opened the door without hesitation, heart starting to pick up speed as the autonomic nervous system began to activate its sympathetic branch. The sheets on his bed were drawn back halfway. There was no sign of the occupant. His bedside lamp was also still on, as if he'd anticipated returning in a matter of minutes. I closed the door and made my way quickly down the stairs. Awful thoughts were flitting through my mind. I, I couldn't stop them. Telling myself that Jack had decided to stay in the library and read the books was comforting. But I only half believed it. Trotting nervously down the hallway, I approached the library doors and tentatively pushed one open with a trembling, white hand. I frantically looked round the spacious library for the doctor, concluding the panic-stricken search with a reluctant survey of the wardrobe. I began to walk closer, my stomach starting to churn at the sight before me, a sight that was intensified by the glare of the overhead lights. There was a stool lying on its side in front of the wardrobe. I looked up at the row of medical books and saw that the fifth or sixth one from the right had been dislodged. It was leaning out from the others at an angle, and there were noises coming from inside the wardrobe, indescribable sounds that succeeded in driving me to the utmost brink of insanity. Barely managing to hold back a scream, I grabbed hold of the handles, and a feeling of utter loathing and revulsion swept through me. Shouting Jack's name over and over in a thick, syrupy voice, I began to wrench at the metal hoops. Replacing Jack's name with savage grunts, I frantically continued, up to the point where I positioned my right foot on the right-hand door, while yanking at the left with both hands. It was no use. They weren't giving at all. I began to scream for the professor, feeling tendons straining in my neck. My voice was starting to crack, 
such was the force of my bellows. Too many thoughts were invading my mind. I think I'd actually gone crazy. Laughter had replaced the screams, high-pitched, hysterical laughter that didn't sound like me at all, devoured by a wardrobe, of all the ways to go, eaten by a carnivorous cupboard. I staggered backwards, tears rolling down my face and dripping from my lower jaw. Collapsing to the floor, my eyes rolled around in their sockets, and encountered the tire lever used to open the crate, propped near a bookcase. Standing back up on legs that threatened to give at the knees, I walked over and seized it. Just before I turned my head away, something caught my eye behind the glass front of the bookcase, a newspaper cutting with a bold headline. Staring at it with a dreadful fascination, I read the words, Stockbroker vanishes into thin air. Continuing to read the smaller print underneath, told me what I had already ascertained, that the person in question was a Mr. William Newport. There were the edges of what looked like another cutting underneath, probably with a headline resembling something like, Mystery Disappearance of Local Youth. I attempted to open the glass front, before realizing that access was only permissible with a key. Approaching the wardrobe with a vengeance, I placed the lever in between both doors and began to forcibly push it forwards. Wood splintered as I twisted it further. It slid in, inch by staggered inch, until a foot of it had disappeared. I then proceeded to shove the remaining six inches vigorously to the right. Sweat ran off my nose in a torrent. Each breath was released in a spittle-spraying expulsion. The door still refused to relent. I withdrew the lever several inches, and tried again. After several renewed attempts, the left door of the wardrobe began to swing outwards, with a horrendous sucking sound. I threw myself backwards, almost to the table, still clutching the tire lever. Picking myself up after only a second or two, I walked towards the thing, squinting my eyes in an effort to see inside. No more than three strides had been executed, before I was hit by a putrid, sickening stench. My stomach heaved instantly, firing a forceful spray of vomit onto the carpet. I squeezed my nose shut with a left hand that seemed to have lost all feeling, before advancing. The door that had opened looked about fourteen inches thick. Wood comprised only two inches of it. The rest was a pink, spongy layer, laced with a meshwork of red, vein-like threads. It was dark inside, but I could determine that the other door and the side were of the same thickness. As my eyes started to adjust to the tenebrous confines, they focused on something protruding from the back wall, something that was sticking out of the pinky-red spongy substance, occasionally twitching. It was a hand, a hand that was gradually sinking into the protoplasmic layer, where the rest of the body had no doubt already been absorbed. With a scream that made something in my throat actually rip, I slammed the wardrobe door shut, expecting it to immediately swing back. It didn't do so, and I almost wept with relief. My head drooped downwards, the tire lever simultaneously slipping through my fingers and clanging to the floor. Without thinking about what I was doing, I stooped to pick up the stool, in order to put it back against the wall. I experienced a brief, cold, stabbing sensation in my chest, the thrust of fear, as the horrific trap that the professor had rigged up became hideously apparent. The bottom two inches of two of the legs had snapped clean off. It was clear that they had been doctored, a notch having been carved in each. Squatting down and holding on to the stool, a shocking mental image began to run its reels in my splintered mind. Brownlow grabs the stool and places it, say, a couple of feet from the right-hand door of the wardrobe, the two legs on the left side being the doctored ones. He stands on it, the legs instantly starting to give way under the weight, reaches up for a book, succeeds in pulling it only halfway out, then the left door of the wardrobe quickly opens, having detected lunch. The two left-hand legs of the stool break, pitching the doctor towards the ghastly interior, where he either stumbled in of his own accord, or was scooped in by the closing door. I stood up as the mental reels whirred to a stop. Walking calmly towards the library doors, I impulsively grabbed a half-full bottle of Perno from the table, and walked out with it. 
By the time I had reached the front door and opened it, the bottle was almost empty. I ran all the way to the train station, which amounted to several miles or so, in an alcoholic daze. I nearly boarded the wrong train, before a small, sober portion of my brain temporarily took command. My luggage had been left behind, but I wasn't ever going back to retrieve it. That was two years ago now. I haven't seen or spoken to Professor Strawbus since. Thank you for listening today. If you'd like to support our work here at Horror Babble, be sure to check out the video description below, where you'll find links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.